welcome to this uh, third uh, in our series Exploring Our Faith. Uh, good to see so many of you here. Probably maybe a couple of, couple of other people might arrive as we've, uh, as we've started. So today we're going to be exploring the Bible in an hour and a half. <laughs> which, uh, we can only do a tiny bit of, but we'll see what we can do. But first of all, um, Carol just wants to say something briefly about another important kind of learning opportunity. So, um, just to give you an overview of what uh, of, of this morning, in a moment, Jane's going to give us a, a broad introduction to the session. I will then take us on kind of a, a, a quick cook's tour of, uh, of the books of the Bible, and uh, towards the, the, the latter half of the session, we'll be exploring two ways in which we can actually use the Bible and learn from it uh, for ourselves, or perhaps with other people as well. Now, over the course of the morning, you'll be given various handouts at different uh, stages, and you can, obviously you can take those away. We're also doing an, an audio recording um, of it, as we've, as we've done previously, so that will be available online uh, in the next couple of days, if you want to revisit it, or if you know somebody who wasn't here who might like to listen to it. And if you've missed the previous sessions, they're available for you to, to listen and watch. Those of you who were at the first session on exploring prayer may remember how we used a psalm as part of that. And we're going to revisit that way of linking um, a prayer and the Bible through a psalm later on this morning. And we're going to use particularly use Psalm 86. So we're going to just start now and play you um, a modern setting of Psalm 86, written only uh, this year. Um, so we can just kind of still ourselves and begin to focus on that element and then we'll be finishing with a, 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 another way of looking at Psalm 86 um, later on. There's none like you, 
No deeds can compare with yours All the nations you've made Will glory your name As they worship before the Lord Teach me your ways I will walk in truth I want my heart to be holy Say from the grave but the Lord Show me a sign of your goodness For others to see me That they would see clearly You are good and your anger is slow Of your love and its power there's no limit to your compassion You are faithful again and again Lord, you gave us the Bible so we might learn from it That we might worship you through it and that we might meet you within it. And we ask your blessing upon our time together, that we all may come to know you more clearly, follow you more nearly, and love you more dearly. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Richard. I hope you're wearing plenty of clothes this morning. If you do get too cold, then just please indicate and we will close the door to a bit. Lovely morning now, isn't it? You may know that the word Bible actually simply means books. And to look at one of these, Whatever translation you choose can be a bit misleading, can't it? Because it looks like a book, but of course it's not. It's a library, a whole load of books. 39 of them assembled over a period of nearly a thousand years. And they contain between them material of very different kinds that you may well know and have consumed that over a lifetime. So, for example, in this book you will find stories, histories, eyewitness accounts, law books, poetry, letters. And it's worth reminding ourselves that therefore, of course, any given book within the Bible has a particular way of being read. Because I don't know about you, but I don't read poetry books in the same way as I might choose to dip in to a book of the law. Today, books are generally written, aren't they, for people that authors do not know. So I know, say, if you're Anthony Horowitz and you're writing for your adolescent boys in that particular strand of your writing, you've got some idea of the consumer. But when we think about the Bible, the Old Testament, of course, was framed by readership or listenership of the Jews. So there's a bit of an idea there. And the Old Testament, therefore, is, to mix my metaphors, a kind of map to be read, showing how to navigate life and live well within it, and how to find peace with God. 
The New Testament section of the Bible is quite different, and you will remember as I say this, even if it's not to the forefront of your mind, that much of it grew out of early Christian community. So one of the things I love about the writings of Paul is when you read the letters, you can so imagine what they were like and the trouble they were having, can't you? And where I resonate with them in their consumership um, encourages me because I think was ever thus, James, was ever thus. And therefore, really, the New Testament in general is more a straightforward guide to living. Because often Paul, particularly, and the Gospel writers are trying to keep people back on track, following in the way. Probably when you think Bible, you might be thinking of that synonym, Word of God. It's often referred to like that. And that's how we regard it, don't we? That ordinary human beings, even the three people who are probably Isaiah, wrote this material down at some point, but were inspired by God in the doing of that. So, of course, scripture has always been like a kind of touchstone, a way of communicating with God and vice versa. So a two-way street, and on a ba daily basis, it may well continue to be so, just like that in your life, a two-way street. How it speaks continues to evolve, doesn't it? So you will have had that experience, as I have, of reading a passage that you know well, and when you turn to it again, it's got something new to say. Or you didn't notice that particular word, did you? And so it speaks into our day and into our time. Church reformer Martin Luther once said, the Bible is the manger in which we find Christ. The Bible is the manger in which we find Christ. As I've been talking, I wonder what the Bible is to you. For me, even as a child, it was basically food. And I have to say, I still go to it primarily, even though I've become very later on in my life a college person, but I come to it primarily to be fed, to be encouraged. And sometimes, probably like you, I need wells, deep wells of wisdom, and I need a deep well of perhaps peace on which to draw. And the Bible is often a place I will go to do just that. And I have my favourite places within it, and that might be what you've been thinking about already this morning. Those touchstone places where you need that little fillet, that lift up in your life, they're the places perhaps you go. So now we're going to have some time to think aloud, as we have before when we've often begun these sessions. Now it may be that you really don't want to think aloud. Thank you very much, Jane, this morning. That's fine. You can be a listener. That's an equally excellent position to take. So in a minute, as we go in our learning together into small groups, 
There is absolutely no obligation for you personally to say anything if you do not want to. That's fine. So, as we've done before, could you, in about 15 seconds, eyeball two or three other people and cluster up into twos, threes or fours? Okay, before we do anything else, that's what we'll do. So you will need to shift your chairs if you've been before, that's what we did. Occasionally people may ask, you know, who wrote the Bible? Um, well, as you can see from the, the, the top of that sheet there, there was around about 40 or so different authors, uh, ranging from shepherds to prophets to kings, all sorts of, of people. In many instances, we don't actually know who the authors are. Uh, some books were certainly edited at a later stage, so there were editors um, as well. As Jane mentioned, the book of Isaiah uh, is generally thought to be written by three people over a period of 250 to 300 years. So already you begin to see there's quite a lot of complexities about who wrote these books and the letters that come together in what we now call the Bible and more on that in a moment. The Old Testament was mainly written in Hebrew, which was the spoken language of the Israelites. Some of it is in Aramaic, originally Aramaic, which is the language of the Arameans in the ancient region of what we now call Syria. And it was a very common language of, of Judea in that first century uh, when uh, Jesus was living. It's most likely kind of a, a Galilee area dialect. Uh, and it's often speculated that that was the language that Jesus spoke uh, when he was relating on a day-to-day -day basis with people. But he probably knew some Hebrew from uh, reading the scriptures when he was in the temple and at other times when he'd be reading the scriptures for himself and probably some Greek. Because the New Testament is primarily written in Greek, um, which alongside Latin became the dominant language for the Roman Empire in the first century. So the time that Jesus was living, those were the languages that were being used. As I hinted at the beginning, it would take a very long time to fully explore uh, the full meaning of the Bible. But in, in essence, one of its messages, it's about the story of God and his people and the sending of Christ as the Messiah to redeem and to save those people. So we'll look at the Old Testament in a little bit more detail. There are three main sections. One is the law, second one is the prophets, and then one that's called the writings. Now the first section is not law in our Western understanding of that word. So Genesis is a book of stories, nothing remotely like rules and regulations, Although the other four bits of that section of the law do contain kind of community laws that were also had many different narratives. Now the word, the Hebrew word for law is the word Torah, which you might have heard of, the Torah. And that means guidance, instruction. It's used quite often for the, those first five books of the Bible is what the Jews lived to, to a primary extent. 
They offer everyday examples of how they felt that people should live and what the legal requirements were. They also became known as the Pentateuch, and that's a tradition. Uh, traditionally, they were it all attributed to Moses. And some parts undoubtedly date from the time when Moses was alive. But as things changed, old laws were updated and new ones were produced. And that was probably the work of editors in later centuries. The second section of the Old Testament is the prophets. That's the largest section. You'll see the various books that are listed in that section. Um, they tend to be called the former prophets and the latter prophets. So the books of the latter prophets, taking that one first instead of former, uh, preserve the sayings and stories of religious and political activists, the prophets. They're, they're not fortune tellers, they're not telling the future. Prophets, as they do now, speak God's word into, today, into the time of the day, the day that we're actually living in. But often they do reflect what then happened in the future. But being a prophet is not about foretelling the future. It's about speaking God into now. So they very much served as a spiritual conscience uh, and have done so throughout its history. They reminded people of the social values that reflected the character of God. And some books are quite substantial. So Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, very long books within there. Others are a lot shorter. Sometimes those prophets could be, they might be mime artists or dramatists, accompanying their actions by short spoken messages. Indeed, the author of, the, of Ecclesiastes has been compared to being a stand-up comedian. <laughs> and in fact, if you read it with that in mind, it is very funny in places. But he uses satire a lot. And you know, the, his, he has his regular themes. And you can really see that within that. So a lot of it is, they're, they're, the, they're the, the, the sound bites of the day. They're the speakers of the day. And that, of course, made it easier for other people to remember and to write it down. If it's a part of the Jewish history is storytelling. But if, you, if you're talking to people in, in sound bites or jokes or satirical comments, people will remember it more easily and therefore pass it on. The former prophets, so Joshua, Judges, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, they're history books. But what makes them also prophets is that they not only record information, they interpret it. They explain its significance in relation to, to other events in the history of Israel and the wider world of their day. The writings of the Psalms, so the songs and the prayers, the liturgy for worship at that time and in Jesus' time and ours, Proverbs, so again, short, snappy sentences, you know, saying homespun wisdom, many of which still live in our language today. Job, which essentially is, is, is a, a dramatic way of exploring the nature of suffering, plus the five, what they call the five scrolls, and they all relate to different feast times. Uh, so that's Ruth, the Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, and Esther. And then there's also the remaining books of the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew uh, books, which were also put into that section uh, of the writings, some of which are history books again, Ezra, Nehemiah, Chronicles, and then Daniel's vision of a better world. On briefly then to the New Testament, um, Lots of different views and theories about when the Gospels were written and who wrote them. Matthew's Gospel comes first in the Bible because at the time that the content of the New Testament was finalised, it was believed that that Gospel was the first one to be written. But uh, as we now know, through kind of further study and research and the finding of original um, uh, 
parchments and paper of papyruses, uh, we know that actually Marx was the first one to be written. Um, and then Luke and Matthew draw very heavily on Mark um, because, because of that fact that Marx is already existing uh, a bit. Um, and also you find in Matthew and Luke quite a lot of it also appears uh, in, in Mark, quite a lot of it appears in Matthew and Luke. Additionally, Matthew and Luke write of quite a bit that isn't found in Mark, and they draw on their own separate services, so sources. But there's also another well-recognised source, um, often referred to as Q, uh, which comes from the German word for, for what, I think, well, it's not quite like well, but like that. So they draw on different sources to compile their Gospels. <coughs> And written in Greek, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke are often referred to as the Synoptic Gospels because they include many of the same stories, often in a similar sequence with similar wording. So the term Synoptic comes from what we, well, how we now have the word synopsis. So it comes from uh, via Latin from the Greek meaning seeing all together. So they give an account of the events from the same and from different points of view. So a little bit like, um, you, you know, if you read three different newspaper accounts of the same um, incident or same event, you get three different versions. And part of that is because of the writer, part of it is because of who they're writing for. Um, so, for example, um, Matthew uh, refers to the Sermon on the Mount, whereas Luke refers to the Sermon on the Plain. They may well have been two separate events. So it shows you that Jane and I and probably Carol are not the only ones who recycle sermons from time to time, and lots of other material, as is some of this. So it could, it could have been two separate events, it could have been the same event, but written in slightly different ways. Matthew wrote primarily for the Jews. Luke wrote primarily for the Gentiles. So that also influences their particular nuances and particular styles. Whereas John's Gospel is distinctly different, both in style and in content. He was about revealing the meaning of what was happening with, through Jesus, whereas the synoptics had their emphasis on events and teaching. So perhaps the most famous passage, the one that we will hear again at Christmas in John, how the word of God became flesh and lived among us. We see his glory, the glory of the Father's only Son. John is explaining the meaning of Jesus' life. The letters, um, often called, often referred to as the epistles, um, largely written to the early Christian fellowship and churches, as Jane mentioned. Uh, Paul wrote to a number of different uh, places and also people such as Timothy, Titus and Philemon. The person who wrote Luke's Gospel um, also wrote the book of the Acts of the Apostles the story of that early church following Jesus' ascension. There are some other letters in there. We don't know who wrote uh, the letter addressed to the Hebrews. Some have speculated it's Paul, but I think a lot of people say that we just don't know. And then finally, within the Bible as we know it, um, written probably at the same time as John's Gospel, is the book of Revelation. And that starts with a series of letters to seven churches and then these dramatic visions um, about, about the end times. It's, it's quite a, a difficult book to get a grip with, um, but it, it is worth reading it, but not necessarily thinking about it too deeply, just let God speak in, in a bit more different way perhaps. We also have a, a section called the Apocrypha, uh, which you will come across printed in some Bibles and uh, particularly in some aspects of the church, the Roman Catholic Church 
in particular. Um, they will often dip into the Apocrypha more, uh, more regularly than we do within the Anglican tradition. So there are two collections of ancient Jewish and Christian writings. Um, and they were, they were accepted, they're accepted by some and not, and not by others, so you will find different versions around. But occasionally we do have readings from the Book of Wisdom uh, or the Book of Tobit. Uh, and again, there's some good stuff in the Apocrypha. And there are lots of other Gospels as well. Gospel of Mary, Gospel of Peter, Gospel of Philip. There's lots of other letters uh, which didn't find their way to be agreed that they would be part of the Bible. Some of them are quite controversial. Some of them will, if, if you think what I've said has stretched your brain a little bit in understanding the Bible, some of those Gospels will do as well. I'll leave it at that and because we'll, we'll go on to the next bit that uh, Jane is going to um, read to us. So I appreciate that. It was a very quick quite intense session with lots of information. Um, I'm happy to send you a copy of my script if that would be helpful, or again, you can just listen to the recording at a later date. Thank you, Richard, and possibly for some of us, that's the best way to cover ground like that, because it's best digested later. Now, an opportunity to interact with the Bible, because as food, that's the best thing to do really, and for an encounter with God. So what we're going to do between about now and towards the end of the section this morning is to look at two very different ways of interacting with the Bible. So I'm going to lead one session now, and then Richard's going to lead another quite different one. As you receive a passage and realise what it's about, perhaps it says more about me than it's about you, but perhaps it might speak into where you're at this morning. It's a very familiar piece of Matthew's Gospel, and we're going to use it as a springboard for our time to be together. So, given the focus of this particular bit of Matthew is about worry, how do you respond to Jesus saying, do not worry? Do you have any tools to help you to take his advice? In verse 25, only appropriate for people in rich developed societies, would that be so? Um, is that so? Does it only apply then to people like us? If, for example, uh, it was in your language and you were herding goats in Ethiopia, would verse 25 speak to you? Verse 31, in a 21st century world, what is that? A reasonable Christian message for the fashion industry? What does it speak to them? What strategies of resistance do you have to cope with the huge amount of advertising? And then a young person says, in my generation, we always want the next thing. It's how we express ourselves and live our dreams. How would you respond to a comment like that? So before we dive into the pool of the Bible, let's just share this passage together. Would somebody who has a loud voice feel they could volunteer to read it. I'll read it. Lovely, Carol. If you want to take your mask off, in fact, Carol, if you want to come up and use the lectern mic. This is from Matthew 24 to 34. Serving two masters. No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. 
Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into farms, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life, to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But, for, but strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. And so Jesus finishes, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. So, a passage you might well have encountered before. And you might have been in a group like this, interacting with the Bible, because this is how a Bible study group might run. And in fact, much of this material comes from a book by a man called John Pritchard, who was the Bishop of Oxford, I do believe, once upon a time. Great man. So we've got six questions. It uh, doesn't matter what order, doesn't matter how many you get through, but we've all got probably about 15 minutes or so to be together. Let's go to it. Bible study groups of various kinds, like me, can probably talk about what places of life they can be when you travel with a particular group of people over a period of time. Over to you, Richard. It's one of our sentences, actually, that with the pandemic, we've not been able to yep. uh, start a house group or two going because um, they are really valuable uh, places. Yep. Okay, I promise you I'm going to speak more slowly in this next uh, session. I apologise for the fact that that session was, uh, was far too intense and not very good. So, if you were here in the first session when we talked about exploring prayer, um, you may remember we mentioned something called Lexio Divina, uh, which is an, an ancient practice, um, and the word means sacred reading or divine reading. Just give that to him, Lexio Divina is not about what we've just been doing, which is, if you like, studying uh, the Bible, but about reflecting on what the words may be saying to us in a prayerful sense. It's about switching off our thinking brain and switching on our listening and our reflecting brain. So what, what we're going to do is to use this psalm. What I suggest is that you put all your other bits of paper 
uh, to one side. And it's Psalm 86, so it's the one which we heard a setting of earlier on. It's one of the psalms that is part of the lectionary, and the lectionary is the pattern of readings that is used throughout the Universal Church, not just the Church of England, um, which takes us through the Bible in different ways, reading set for particular days, reading set for services in each day. And psalm 86 is one of the psalms set for today. So you've got the words there on that, that smaller green piece of paper. And in a moment I'm going to read them. And it's up to you whether you want to read them with me or just simply uh, listen. We'll then have a couple of minutes of silence. I'm then going to read them again. And in that second time of reading, I'd like you to see if there's a particular word or phrase that just stands out to you, that speaks to you at this precise moment. And then in this period of science that follows that second reading, I'd like you just to ruminate on that particular word, that phrase that comes to you. You might like to just repeat it to yourself or just reflect upon it. And then uh, at a particular point, I'll just prompt you then to use those words as a prayer. It's actually to pray from those words to God. So we're using only perhaps a tiny bit of the Bible as part of our prayer to God and then listening to Him. There is no right or wrong way to do this. Don't try too hard. Don't think about the words. Just let them resonate within you use the, the, those words in the silence. But first I'll just read the psalm and then we'll have a, a couple of moments, a couple of minutes uh, silence after that. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all day long. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving. About <coughs> Abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my cry of supplication. In the day of my trouble, I call on you, for you will answer me. that a particular word or phrase has uh, stood out to you, in which case hold on to that phrase, don't change it. But if not, as I read it a second time, just see if there's anything from that that particularly stands out and speaks to you at this
this time. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all day long. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my cry of supplication. In the day of my trouble, I call on you, for you will answer me. So taking your particular word or phrase, just pray to God from that. poor and needy. We are 
devoted to you. You are our God. I ask that you would gladden our souls. And we praise you that you are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love. We might continue to give your ear to us, to our prayer. When days of trouble, you answer us. Amen. Inevitably in a session like this, that was a very shortened version of the way that one can do that particular practice, but it might give you something that you can use at home. Uh, choose you know, a passage from the Bible to just pick out. If, you know, if, you're reading, if you're reading a passage from the Bible and suddenly you're stopped in your tracks by a particular phrase or word, mm -hmm. stay with that and pray from it. Happy to talk further about that. Um, and if you want a little bit more about quiet and reflective time, um, there's a quiet morning St. John's Bishop on the 2nd of December would be welcome to come and join Jane and I uh, with, with that. So just to finish off this particular session, Jane just going to uh, give us a quick crooks tour of a couple of other things that uh, can be helpful when we are exploring the Bible for ourselves. Thank you, Richard. What we are running on the second in the morning at St. John's Bishop is for the whole of the team and anybody else who is a friend of yours or a contact of yours who you feel might appreciate on the threshold of Advent. Two short reflective talks and some silence. There will be opening prayers, closing prayers. There'll be more information in due course, but on the second it runs from 10 o'clock in the morning at St John's Bishop to 1 o'clock. And the strap line for it is the meaning is in the waiting. The meaning is in the waiting. So as Richard said, we've done what we felt able to do this morning or more we couldn't. But just before we go off into coffee or elsewhere, there are one or two things about interacting with the Bible that you may or may not have used. We began with some music. Uh, quite a lot of composers have embedded the Bible in their music, both modern composers and very ancient composers, and that might be a way that you have hopefully, in the course of your life, delightfully, heart movingly consumed the Bible. If you are a visual thinker, there are visual ways to consume the Bible, and this morning I've deliberately brought some visual material produced by a particular woman. You might know her, Hannah Dunnett. She uh, works in Cornwall as a Christian artist. She trained as a doctor, extraordinarily, from a family of doctors, but then felt led, and there's a story to that, into using the Bible through art. So I brought three examples from the Vicarage, which you're welcome to look at this morning if you don't know her work. Two are cropped up by Yorta. She produces cars as well. This one, God of All Comfort, is absolutely typical of the kind of thing she does. So they're stylized pictures, and into them, if you look at it closely, she stitches verses from across the Bible on particular things. So there's one on wisdom, 
this one on Christ, the light of the world, and this one God will comfort hangs above the desk in my study. So there are visual ways to engage. Creatively, some of you, thank you Richard, uh, will know that um, because of my professional background, I do actually like poetry. The proof man can do to you may have come across uh, by me or Heaven and Herman Hover or somebody else. His latest book is called David's Crown and it's his response in poetry to each of the Psalms. So that's another way to engage with the Bible and I'm currently reading three a day to do that. Daily notes, you may have used those over the years, many sources for those. Scripture Union is a good place to go. The Bible Reading Fellowship, BRF, is another one. And the one I wanted to finish with really is if you're quite imaginative, um, it may be that the Ignatian way approaching scripture would be helpful. If that means nothing to you, do talk to somebody like Carol or me or Sue about it or Richard after some Ignatius. But basically it's a way of entering into biblical scripture and imagining that you are there. If you're not a person whose imagination already works quite actively, you will find that a very dry place to go. Um, but yeah, there is the emotion. So, thank you for being team this morning. As we close, let's hold a moment. And in that moment, see if you want to harvest anything that you have heard, anything that you have been gifted in the name of the one who brings life. Yeah. <laughs> so go well, team, and I'm 